This is part one of the Besotted Pride of West London end of season podcast featuring Gary Roberts and Francis Joseph. To check out part two and part three, go to Audio Boom and check out the Besotted channel or go to besotted.co.uk. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Audio Boom, Acast, and all the other applications. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the besotted Pride of West London end of season bees up. At at the, and dare I say it, at the fabulous Drayton Court Hotel in Ealing. Isn't it absolutely brilliant, this place, isn't it? Classy team, classy venue, you know what I'm saying? It's peas, cheese and bees. That's right, mate, you know. So listen, we've come here today, and uh, as you know, um, myself, Lainey, um, we run Besotted, the Brentford fanzine, the blog, the podcast, the God, whatever else that we do, we just like, we enjoy doing things Brentford, we write about Brentford, we video Brentford, we podcast Brentford, we just do all sorts of stuff, and we just thought to ourselves, probably about a year ago, we thought it'd be really nice to get, as we called it, like minded souls to come down get them in a room together drink some beer talk Brentford or talk whatever else you want to have a bit of music have a bit of photographs have a bit of video have a bit of food have a bit of drink and talk Brentford and we also said it'd be great to have an evening where we can keep football out of football because we all get together on a match day and football's probably the one thing that ruins it some of the time <laughs> so we so we can all be together all like-minded souls as Bill said with some of the players that have been brilliant for Brentford over the years and we can just talk about the good times we haven't got to worry about the 90 minutes getting in the way and that's right so we, we, we organised the first social up in uh, at the Globe we did, about 60, 65 of you turned up. There were Terry Evans, and it was Ida was there as well. And Marcus Gell, absolutely fantastic night. Then we had the, the bees up in the brewery, which was... Which was <laughs> it was actually in the Fuller's Brewery, as some of you may not go about it. It was... Uh, what, it was, was what was that again? It was Can the you brewery. rewind it? It was the bees up in the brewery. So it was actually in the Fuller's Brewery. It was an open bar all night. And uh, basically, I think everybody did very well to actually have got out of there safe, except for Harry Potter as well, of course, because he ran into... <laughs> He ran into various walls during that evening. We love the Potter. He's a good, he's a good guy, but he, he, he didn't make it out of there alive. <laughs> but, Harry Potter. The Potter, yeah, Harry Potter. I mean, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry Potter is one of the original he's Brentford boys, you know. So that was that as well. So the bees up in the brewery. So this is our third one here, we thought. We've got, like I said, we've got some great lineup here as well um, today. Today we've got four ex-Brentford legends. We've got, to the right of me, you've got Mr. Francis Joseph. We got Mr. Gary Roberts. Gasping. Gasping. <laughs> and then later on, because we, you know, we can't have them all in at one time because it'll be absolute carnage, we're going to have a little break, we're going to have a comedian, we're going to have an auction, we're going to have all sorts of nonsense, and then we're going to have Billy Manuel. Who was that? Who was that? Billy, what was his name? Billy the Pitbull Manuel. <laughs> and also we got Graham he Benstead. He is he? He's definitely here. So Graham Benstead in the house as well. We're going to have them as well later. So. And, and, also, and also, big big welcome to Alan Cockrum and to Idra Anderson, who's, who's come back. So brilliant, brilliant to see Alan Cockrum. That's right. So first of all, as we say, manners. And we normally do this early because normally when we do our um, thanks at the end of the evening, it all goes a bit horribly wrong because by the time you've had about eight beers, it's, it's just, it just doesn't really happen. So, you know, yeah. So what I'm going to say at the beginning here is we want to just go out to a lot of thanks to people. And if I've forgotten anyone else, Laney helped me as well here. So first of all, I want to thank Fullers for sorting us out and helping us. Like I said to you, we were at loggerheads. I wouldn't say loggerheads with them, but we were, we, 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 we worked out a little relationship with them. Where they've been very good to us and they've helped us out. And we, we had to come at short notice to try and find a venue. They found us this fantastic venue here and they've sorted everybody out. And they just said, Brentford fans, we want them to have a great night. So we have to say, very much thanks to Fullers tonight for sorting us out. At, 
at the same time, I want to say thanks to the Drayton Court Hotel. They've been lovely. They've sorted us out everything that we wanted to. They've got us brilliant food, brilliant tables, brilliant stage, brilliant, you know, everything. everything. It's just been fantastic. Brilliant Bri- chandeliers. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant tablecloths. That's right. <laughs> hey, what about them? That's brilliant right. Concrete. That's right. No. And then we want to thank the players and Iger and everybody else as well. Um, I want to thank everybody else that's been helping out with us. Claire and Richard have been helping out with all the organisation, the door as well, myself and Lainey. Anybody else that's been helping out with that as well. We want to thank you all. But I think everybody, we've got more thankings to do later. Let's get on with the show here because I think everyone really wants to find out what's been going on with these two boys here. We've got Francis Joseph and you've got Gary Roberts. And let's just have a little chat to find out what was happening (coughs) back in the day. I think I've got to start with you, Joe. And, well, yeah. should, oh, should we start with Gary? Because Gary no, was... No, let's start with Jerry because Gary was just Gary started the club a little bit earlier than Joe. Yeah, but you don't pass the ball. <laughs> <laughs> we, we used to call it glory hunting at the, back in the day. That's right. You know? But anyway, okay, look, but, that's but, his problem. Listen, we'll start with Gary, right, and he'll tell you why he didn't pass the ball to you. Yeah. And, you know, and then we get on there. Laney. Hey, have we got a lie detector test here or what? Oh, we'll, 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 we will start in, in... Dave, can I cover that point? Well, no, you're, yeah. you're the reason I didn't pass the ball to him is because he couldn't shoot properly. Yeah? <laughs> he had one leg as well, yeah? And that was his left leg. Yeah. Yeah? So if it was anywhere apart from that, it was like he used to fall over. Right? So that's the reason why I used to shoot on my own most of the time. Stan never thought so. And also as well, probably as the highest scoring winger in history. Yeah. So we're going back. Let's go way back. Let's let's go back to you as a little baby because we we we've, we've worked out. Well, there was one of your teachers was here tonight as oh, well. I tell you, what, it was really brilliant to see him, Mr. Brett as well. Yeah, from Cardinal Manning in um, St. Charles Square in Labrick Grove, and to bump into him again was fantastic. Right, and he's brought me a, a little picture of myself when I was young. <laughs> Well, you don't really want to see them, do you? But they <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we're, we're, that's not that's not in the I'll auction. You, that's I'll, not in the auction. I'll tell you what, if I take it home, I'll feel like a kidney fiddler. Well, no, you know what's going on? Well, he's a, he's a police. He's a he's a, oh, he's a retired sorry. policeman, so he's he's an asset. Um, I've got this picture of a child. Oh, it's me. <laughs> so you were born born in Wales, born in Real. Yeah, unfortunately. So well, you you know you're Welsh, and you know you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As I said in the, in the Brentford Chronicle once, I'm as much a part of London as Pie and Mash because I was brought up here, yeah? And I consider, always consider myself the, uh, the English. So talk, talk, go back to those, those early days, North Paddington boys and going out on loan to Hayes. T- tell us about, you know, who, who you modelled yourself on. Were there players that you used to watch on the TV or go and watch that you thought, I, I want to be that kind of player? Well, my favourite all-time player was Johan Cruyff. Right? And obviously... Uh, he nicked my turn, didn't he? Have you? <laughs> I, I'm not joking. If you actually see it, I, I predate him on that turn, right? But because I didn't have the coverage, he got the he got the name, didn't he? And the Cruyff you, turn. Can you tell us the game that happened in? Because I, I I watched most of your career and I don't remember that. You don't? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually the first game against Fulham. Well, my no, sorry, not my first game. My first game it was Carlisle. You might not have been there. Oh, uh, probably might have been there. Yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> it was actually in that game. I got cramp at the time. Oh, was it at Carlisle? Yeah. Oh, no, I wouldn't have been Yeah, it was at, I turned and my, cramp, my calf cramped up after 60 minutes. Yeah, and they had to take me off. So I couldn't do it again in the game. And then two weeks later, Johan Cruyff actually did it in a match. And they called it the Cruyff turn. Well, you, know, you, should, have, you, should, have, you should have trademarked it. You should have absolutely trademarked it. <laughs> Uh, so, Fred Callahan, he spotted you when he was manager of Woking. You were playing for Wembley. Yes. Um, and he, he said at the time it was a game that, in, that you scored and you fractured your skull and your jaw while, while doing that. Is that true? No. <laughs> no. No. You didn't fracture your skull. No, no, no. no. I actually fractured my skull and my jaw when I was on loan to Hayes. Ah. Which was probably six months before, because I couldn't play for five months after that. But John Griffin was the man that came and watched me play. And uh, the final game they saw me play, I actually put the ball over from a yard out, and I thought <laughs> my chance had gone. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I got signed after that. So what was this horrific injury? How did that happen? Uh, in a match, just an aerial collision. I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but 
his head was going that way and mine was going that. So, yeah, Mickey Preston, he was the England non-league centre-half at the time and he headbutted me when I was on loan there. Yeah. Ouch. Um, I was in Harefield for three days after that. Harefield Hospital, yeah, but it's one of those things, isn't it? But you, you recovered, obviously. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> Physically, Dave, not mentally. <laughs> So, t- so t- tell us about tell us about this this uh, monumental first meeting with Fred Callahan to to sign you. you pa- this is where you your nickname gasping um, uh, happens. He, he says in this report he says that he met you in the hotel in um, Swiss Cottage, yes. and he said, "Can I get you a drink?" And you said, "I'm gasping for a lager." And so this is a manager who's about to sign you, and he said he he, he, he had one downed it in one, and then. You asked him for another one. Well, <laughs> taken in its entirety, yeah. You know what I mean? Right? Right? Basically, I'd been waiting two hours. Yeah, I'd got the timing wrong for the meeting. Rick Wakeman was there, by the way, as well. And the only reason we could get an after-hours after, after hours drink was because Rick was obviously the big star that he was because drinking wasn't allowed after 3 o'clock in those days. And um, he ordered us a few beers. And the first one I got, obviously, I did sort of rather neck quickly. But... <laughs> I will say this, right? and, and, and Jimmy's got to take a lot of the responsibility for this, Mr. Jimmy Walsh, yeah? who nicknamed me Gasping, and, I, and then they started singing it, which didn't have a great effect on people coming to watch me, you know, other clubs. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, were there other pro clubs in for you at the time Brentford were sniffing around? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was uh, Southampton and a few other teams. But, I mean, I lived in London. I lived in West London as well, <coughs> and... Yeah, well, it seemed a natural fit for me. And had you had you been to Brentford before you signed? What, what did you know about the club? Uh, there was lots of big companies that worked around there, weren't there? I never knew about the football club. To be perfectly honest. I, I mean, I, I had a year watching QPR at football. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they were a good team then. Obviously, they finished second in the in the in the league. But it was, I wasn't. I didn't think I'd be a professional footballer at that time, being in non-league football and then working as a as a brick player. So it was a it was it was a good move for me. So the Isthmian League was was kind of a, it was good hunting ground for Brentford at the time. We we sort of we picked you up from Wembley. Yeah. We had um, Terry Herlock that came in um, a little bit afterwards, and then um, uh, David Crown as well. I think they were signed before me. Actually, Terry and... Um, oh, no, they weren't. Yeah, just after. Crowney and Terry Olock. I mean, fantastic signings. And at the time as well, there were lots of players at that level who could play uh, professionally as well. So, yeah, pleased that I got signed. So, the, those signings from the Eastman League, were, were they Fred's contacts or was it just that it was a very good league? I think, no, John Griffin had a, had a really good scouting system at the time and um, he used to get about watching, watching loads of teams. And uh, I think he signed about two or three others as well from the league. And John Griffin, he came back under Ron Nose's ear as well, and he was he was he was instrumental in getting some very good players for us over over sort of three generations, really. So you know, what, tell us about Griff. What kind of what kind of man was he? John, very soft-spoken man, nice to speak to. Uh, knew his football, obviously, obviously non-league. He knew the non-league scene quite well as well, um, all around the London area in particular. Didn't go out of his comfort zone as such but knew enough players around the area to make a difference. So how, how was that step up? So you, you've been part-time, part-time uh, at a very good standard, semi-pro. How was it going full-time and going training every day and your life must have changed overnight? <laughs> My life didn't really change overnight because the money wasn't particularly good, I'll be honest with you. I was probably, I was probably earning more doing what I was doing, you know? Um, and the standard, that was the, 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 the real difference. I jumped up sort of like three, four levels, like because I was only playing Isthmian Division One, not even the Premier Division. So um, coming into training was really hard. Like the first, I mean, my first picture was taken with uh, Chopper Harris on my back. I mean, that's enough for anyone, isn't it? <laughs> never mind him, all, never mind him all over your legs, right? on your back as well, you know. But he's, yeah, so I found it, I found it hard. I found it hard for the first two, three weeks. Uh, at least, and then I had a little spell in the team where I played two or three games, got left out for about two months, and then after after Christmas, like three months, I acclimatised to it. 
and talk us through some of those characters. Your your first day at the training grounds, who welcomed you? What what kind of what? How do they make you feel at home, or was it really kind of a baptism of fire for you? It was a bit of a baptism of fire. I'll be honest with you, because professionals in those days were quite cutting, because anyone that came in was after their job. I'll be honest with you, and there was a little click at the time at Brentford. You know, but I wasn't one to shy away from things and I quickly made myself, you know, quite upfront with a lot of them. And um, I think that got me through. Who, who was the click? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was an obvious click, right? Paul Walker and a few of the other boys, right? The local lads that were around there at the time. Which one's yeah. that gone? <laughs> well, Paul Walker. Yeah, Paul Walker. Oh, you know. Barry Tuck. Yeah, you know. Pat Cruz, Jim McNichol. Right, they're all a little click in the, in the club. But I ended up getting on very well with quite a few of them. You did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Pat Cruz has been to all... Uh, so he went to the 70s launch and he went to the 80s launch. He's, he's, a, he's a top lad. Barry Tucker was at the, the 80s book launch as well. Um, they, they've all loved coming back and um, reminiscing about Brentford as well. Um, I hear that, oh, talking about training, it says in that article as well that you ignored, famously ignored a couple of your teammates when it was pissing down with rain at a bus stop and they got their revenge on you. <laughs> <laughs> Enlighten me, Dave. Oh, I'll, I'll, dig, I'll, dig, I'll dig out the article in a minute. No, obviously not. <laughs> you know, it said they, um, they, they, they let your tyres down. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I was using an old van at the time that I used to use for work before I actually joined uh, for my building work. And <laughs> two of the tyres weren't particularly good on it anyway, so they could have fallen down themselves. <laughs> And we were looking at, I mean, I don't know if you can see, we've got sort of hundreds and hundreds of old photographs that are in, in the 80s and 90s books that are on rotation over here. And when, when Gary arrived, there was there's one of them um, when Brentford went on a tour to Yugoslavia in 80, 81. Um, that, was, that was quite a big trip. You know, tell, tell, us, about, tell us about the journey, because it, it was two quite high-profile high games that you played in. Yeah, well, one of them was, yeah, we played Dubrovnik Town right away. You must have heard of them, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> European giants of the, of, of the Yugoslav third division. Yeah? That was our first match, and we got there. Well, obviously, we'd gone out the night before, and we played, and we lost 3-1. <laughs> and Chopper Aris, who was playing behind me at left back, right, kept smashing the ball long, yeah? and just giving the ball, because he couldn't see over 10 yards as well, as anyone knows. Yeah? Right? So he kept smashing it. So I had the temerity to turn around and say to him, Chopper, pass it to my feet. At which point he went, fuck off, Garth. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> yeah? Which most of you that know him will understand, yeah? And which led to a small argument on the pitch, which my subsequent substitution. <laughs> so I spent the last 20 minutes of that match having a lager with a couple of Bees fans that were actually on the trip in the stand, right, rather than sitting down. Such went on. <laughs> so the rest of the trip was the same. We moved to hijack Split, because Dan Tarno was our chairman at the time. Anyway, we moved up to Split, and uh, Chopper had a word with Fred and decided he wasn't <laughs> going to play me in the game. <laughs> How... Yeah. So, yeah, that's not obviously, yeah, you, yeah. you put his nose out of joint. Oh, I did, yeah, yeah, but I had a great trip anyway, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. It's my first encounter with German nudists as well. Right. Is it? Yeah. We stayed, well, in, we stayed in the Dubrovnik Palace. We were looked after really well, and um, not knowing, you know, obviously about Germans at the time and how hairy they were, we, <laughs> we wandered down to, to this secluded beach. <laughs> To be, to be encountered by the most Im immense amount of hair I've ever seen in my life. All right. Yeah. Well, body hair. And, that, and that's how you got into nudism? Well, I never actually got into it, but, you know, <laughs> so it was an encounter. So, I mean, the, the team that you, you, you walked into, or the team that you, you joined, very attack-minded team. We were, we were building um, under Fred Callaghan. Um, Stan Bowles, Chris Kamara, Francis Joseph and Keith Bowen were all teammates of yours. Can you talk, talk us through that, that team and, and at that, that attack-mindedness and how you were encouraged to just get forward? And as you said, you scored a lot of goals. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we, uh, 
We probably didn't. I well, did. can I, can I, I, well, he scored a few. He scored a few, obviously, when I put him on his head. You know what I mean? But we had, um, how can I say this? We were sort of over-biased on, uh, on attack, I think. I mean, not enough attention was paid to our back line, without a doubt. Uh, our front six were as good as anything. You know, our goalkeeper was sort of average at the time. Oh, come on. He was, he, he was better than that. Was he? Paddy. Oh, Paddy. Yeah, Paddy was, yeah, yeah, Paddy was good. He made one of the best saves I've ever seen him make. What, what? Uh, Just one? Uh, yeah, only one. <laughs> <laughs> only, one. only one. He saved a par once when he was playing golf as well. But, uh, but, uh, no, but we were over-biased on attack. Uh, the front players were absolutely brilliant going forward. Um, but defensively, we were, we were short, without a doubt. Whether that was something he couldn't sort out or whether it's something he didn't think he needed to sort out, I don't know. But, I mean, Fred was a, was a, was a terrific man-manager. Without a doubt, you know he, he communicated with the players. Some of us did drive him to distraction at times. You know, I'll say that. Yeah, <laughs> not just myself, but other people. But I well, think other people on this stage. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. But but he he you know I thought he coped with it really well. So I mean, tell us a bit more about Fred. Fred's, you know, he, he still goes to Fulham a lot. I, I, I know he's he's part of their, well, he ha was part of their setup for a long time. Yeah. They, he, they does a lot of legends talks and stuff like that. So tell us about Fred Callahan as a as a manager and as a as a man, really. As a fella, I got on really well with him. You know, um, it's difficult to judge people against other people when you you know in different eras of uh, of coaching and managing and. And how you deal with people, you know. I mean, I've I've been in management myself, obviously in non-league management for 20 years. So, you know, you look at things uh, that you've been sort of like through the situations that you've been through, and you try and you try and sort of like deal with them either the same or different, or take experiences away from that. Fred himself, right, was quite a straight up front bloke. You know, he'd had a good football career himself. You know, he knew what he was doing, and as a defender. Probably I thought he might have, you know, he might have got a grip on the defensive side of things. But he brought good players into that club as well. So, you know, over, when you look at him overall, I think he had a good effect on Brentford. And you, you say about bringing good players into the, into the squad or into the team. Um, Stan Bowles is um, he's, he's, he's a name that no, no one needs explaining about who Stan Bowles is. You know, I know he's got his problems at the moment and we all wish him well with that. And I know um, we're... we're playing a very small part in helping um, promote his Alzheimer's issue at the moment. And I think there might be a game where um, Brentford are involved in playing QPR. It might happen early part of next season, but it's something that's ongoing. Um, but can you, what, what kind of, what was the buzz around the, the training ground? And what did you think about Stan Bowles coming to join? You must have been hugely excited. Well, we were. I mean, he was obviously a big name. Um, I mean, he probably wasn't as fit as he should have been. You know, he probably... You know, probably everyone knows that. Uh, if he'd have been fitter, he probably could have done a lot, done a lot more for us. But his influence on the team, you know, he, he was a good fella. We all got on well with him. And uh, I think he contributed to some really good times. And he, and he fitted in straight away, did he? He wasn't aloof. He, he, was, he, he just joined in and he was one, one, of, the, one of the team? Or? Yeah, yeah. He was difficult. I mean, because he had that little entourage that used to pop around with him as well. The old, the Shepherd's Bush crew, as they called them, you know. <laughs> He'd have an assortment of people waiting outside the ground for him. Right? Like Billy Proper the, characters. Billy the Hat. Timmy the Teapot. <laughs> Slates. <laughs> Slates. Slates, you know. Obviously, he'd been involved in a little bit of roof tile nicking in his time. You know. So, just, so just, he's pretty, he was pretty much the whole of the Shepherd's Bush underworld. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah, that was it. But I'll tell you, I mean, Stan gave me an opportunity to see London nightlife at its best as well. <laughs> okay, it's not Tommy Cooper, is it? You're going to come through that, are you? I think Francis has uh, gone for a wander. <laughs> um, Talking of talking of characters and underworld, um, Terry Herlock was uh, he, he he joined around that that time as well. Terry Terry Herlock had a few run-ins with the law, 
Um, and as a, as, a, as, a, as a policeman in later life yourself, what, looking back, what, 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 what was Terry up to? <laughs> Terry? Yeah. Oh, dog fighting, you know, uh, cock baiting, everything. <laughs> no, I mean, no. We're not talking about the Germans anymore. No, no, we're not, no. No, look, Terry was absolutely brilliant with me, right? We, me and him used to get on really well. He did used to encourage me certain, on certain, you know, when we were away to do certain things that I probably shouldn't have done. But I still, I still speak to him now, you know, and we get on really well. He was a great character, a super footballer, yeah, and someone that, you know, you'd want to you'd be behind. Well, you would certainly want him in your team, wouldn't you? Oh, definitely. You'd want him in your team as well when you're having a fight. Without a doubt. And that happened, didn't that? Well, as you say, he, he, his reputation was a hard man, but he, he, he was one of the best footballers, footballing, te- you know, as, as we've, we've ever seen. So, you know, what was he like to, to play with? He was a good player. I mean, he, was, he probably should have scored more goals than he did, without a doubt, you know, with his, with his ability and his uh, shot making as well. He, he should have more, scored more goals, but terrific player to play with. Mm-hmm. Good captain as well, and um, when he fancied it, Joe, wasn't it? Is that you know. <laughs> <laughs> what was that slate? Yeah. <laughs> so um, Martin Lange, rest in, you know, rest in peace. He was he was the chairman at the time. What, what are your memories of Martin? Are you trying to get me controversial here? No. no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, Martin was Martin was a nice fella. Okay, well, we'll, we'll move on. So Brentford were involved in sev- several memorable League Cup runs um, in the early 80s. Swansea, Liverpool and, and Forest. Um, you, you scored after 20 seconds in that replay up at, uh, up at Betchfield. You, they, that, that season and, and those Cup runs, that helped really build you as a, as a player. Your, people were starting to talk about you. Yeah, I mean, how can I say this? My career at the time, personally, was, was flying, you know, and I was doing really well. And um, that gave me a lot more confidence because, obviously, it's, it does take you a while to, to sort of adapt to professional football in terms of how you feel, you know, how you rank amongst your peers um, in particular. And uh, the second year in particular in football, you know, in, in, in uh, professional football, you know, I started to score a lot of goals. I started to get noticed. I started to feel more confident with people as well, you know. I mean, it was nice to have people that I knew around me as well. You know, there's three or four of us knew each other right, through London, you know, around our area and stuff. So uh, that was that was a bonus as well. And those those League Cup games, especially, well, I mean, the one that stands out for me, I'll never forget, was Liverpool at home. It was one of the best Liverpool teams of, of all time, certainly in that, certainly in that era. And, you know, it was a... It's the, the official crowd was 17 or nearly 18,000. There seemed to be a lot more in Griffin Park that night. It was, it was, it was full. It was full. Um, and you scored, you made it one all. You scored, we went one nil down and you scored, t- t- you know, that, that must be something you, you, still, you still remember viv- vividly. Well, we should never have been one nil down. Right? If anyone sees the video of that now, right, it's on YouTube, it's an outright foul on, um, on who was it, I think, Dean Whitehead, was it? Alan Whitehead. Alan Whitehead. Alan Whitehead. Yeah, absolute foul on him. The bloke pulls him around the neck. Yeah, you know. So we shouldn't have been. Yeah, we shouldn't have been one nil down. And then we get the opportunity. Joe goes down the line, cuts it back to me. I clip it to the far post, as they say. <laughs> the lucky grubbler I wasn't actually letting one in at the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't roll over that one anyway. <laughs> So, you know, to describe that feeling, you know, that they, it's those moments that must stay with you right now. Well, they do, they do, because obviously they're, they're moments that are etched in your memory, and they're moments that are, that are etched on YouTube, you know, and stuff like that, the benefits of that. And it's something you can tell your kids about, not that they're interested, but... <laughs> 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 or, or your friends down the pub. <laughs> there you go. So they, they switch off now, they go glazy-eyed, do they, they? I've told them so many times, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm more interested in telling them about how my golf game's going, you know? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, but again, we, you know, they, the game up at Swansea, they were, they were in the top flight, they were a decent team at the time. We drew with them at Griffin Park, went back to the Vetch. You scored after 20 seconds. Yeah, well, I think it was less than that, actually. It's the quickest ever way goal at Swansea. And I think you 
give me another little cross that day. Well, that was probably his best position out on the left wing, really. You know what I mean? <laughs> Crossing it in, yeah? And I put it in straight away, don't worry. But um, Paddy Roach made one of the best saves I've ever seen in my yeah, life absolutely. that day. Just, yeah, when we were winning 2-1, and uh, he made a save from Bob Latchford, right? uh, you know, who was a good player, from six yards out, and it was akin to Gordon Banks in the World Cup. It was that good. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, you f- in this interview, which I'll, I will give you a copy of it because it's absolutely blinding, it says um, you went to pre-season t- um, training at Butlins, or you went on a tour to Butlins, and you were, you were caught in the early hours by the manager on stage in front of 300 people singing When I'm Cleaning Windows. Yeah. Do you want to... Is, is this something you want to relive tonight? Uh, in front have of you got a, a spoon? <laughs> I, well, we'll find one. I played the spoons as well at the same time. They were doing a talent contest. Yeah, and they were asking for people to go up. Right? So I decided to do George Formby right? when I'm cleaning windows on the spoon. Oh, you got a fork? Oh, I can do a fork as well. Don't worry about that. Yeah. They're similar, aren't they? Fork and spoon? No, two forks. Oh, two spoons. Yeah. They're forks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put them together. Hold up. Now I go windy cleaning to earn an honest bob. For a windy cleaner, it's an interesting job. Oh, windy cleaning you must be if I could see what you could see. Well, I'm cleaning windows. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something I never thought I'd see. <laughs> Absolutely tremendous stuff. Teething tremendous, as someone else might say. <laughs> I, actually do Neil, I do Neil Diamond now, though, on karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other, the other highlight, the other highlight before we move on, Francis is going to be up next. Is your th- your five minute hat trick? It, we- it was less than that. Okay, okay, it was either it was either side of half time anyway. So it was three minutes and something. Well, it was New- Newport County at home, Freight Rover area final. The game, bef- the ga- six yeah, Friday night, six nil we won. It was a, I, I, I well. It seemed like it was a huge crowd, but looking at the figures, there's only 8,500, but it seemed like a big, big crowd there that night. Yeah. Um, and then that set us up for a, a, Wembley, a Wembley visit. <laughs> but that, that was quite a, that was quite a um, decent cut run. We, we played Bournemouth down at Dean Court in a really edgy game. And I, I think I just about made it back to my car. I think the people running around that park with branches trying to clump us. <laughs> um, so, but t- t- tell us about that cut run briefly and, you know, and, and Wembley. Nobody give a monkeys about it until, the, until we won the first game. And then all of a sudden, we decided that you know, we were quite interested in it. And then as it went on, and we got to the Southern Area semi-final, or Southern Area final, I should say, uh, you know, it, it took great importance. And then for us, I mean, Newport at the time were, were a reasonable team, and they had quite a few decent, you know, good players playing for them. So we were expecting a much harder game than we got. And uh, to be... I think it was, what were we, 2-0 two, two up, 3-0 up at half-time? Yeah, that just set it for us. You know, and then when we came out, I mean, my dad, is a little story for you. My dad, he liked a little drink at the time. And I'd scored my first goal just before half-time. And he went in early and missed it for a quick beer. He came out late and missed it. <laughs> right? He missed the hat trick, yeah? Because right? the two happened right very quickly. So he only saw me score the fourth goal. So when I came in after the game, he went, he said, why are you got a match ball? I said, well, I've got three goals there. Oh, i got four goals. Right? He went, well, when did that happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> B- rest his soul. Anyway. Sounded like he had a blinding night. Oh, he did. We're, we're, he stayed we're... out till five o'clock that morning. Around every, all the pubs stayed open late, if you remember, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you out there, mate. The old, the old cheeks were shining, weren't they, that night? <laughs> if you were lost, you could find Jimmy's cheeks in the dark. That was it, wasn't it? We'll, we'll, we're taking some questions from the floor in a, in a, in a little bit, but I'm going to hand over. Let's have a round of applause for Gary Roberts, please. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant to see him back with Brentford fans. He's, he's, he's really adored still. And I'll pass you over to Bill and God help him. So, so we're in here still, and Gary's still going to be involved in this because obviously we're going to be talking about. I'm going to talk to Francis now as well. But Francis and Gary played together in the same team, and they 
Oh, apparently he didn't pass to him, but you know, but you know, they seem to score a lot of goals between themselves. But Francis Joseph, <laughs> just going to go through the career of this man, not the full career, but Wimbledon, 1980 to 82, 14 goals in 51 appearances. And then, was that Wimbledon? That's Wimbledon, yeah. Right. And then I remember, I, I, player rem- of the year. I remember, I'll tell you something, player of the year, I've got that as well. <laughs> Listen, player, player of the year for Wimbledon, you saw that as well, you've been, reading, right. my, you've, no, no, you've been reading my notes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, but what I, I'll tell you something, this is what I really remember though, because I remember we played, Wimbledon had come up from non league, and then we played them, and it was a Monday night, on a cold Monday night it was, and I remember watching the game, and we were like, oh yeah, you know, typical Brentford, we were like up and down, up and down, up and down. And I remember, I think if I remember rightly, it was, uh, we were 2 0 up against Wimbledon at half time. 2 0 up. Yeah, wicked. Stan Bowles scored directly from a free kick. Gary Johnson scored from a great goal for half time. Next minute, the second half, there was this geezer just come in, bang, 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 and you scored, you were on fire. You were on fire. And everyone's like, oh, who's that bloke? Who's that bloke? You absolutely ripped us apart and you beat us 3 2 in that game. You remember that one? 3 2, I'd never forget it. That was the turning point in my career. It was unbelievable. And, be, and we were going, we should sign him up. We should sign him up. A couple of months later, you were in the squad. Yeah, but I got tapped up that night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> so tell us about it. I'm sure it don't count now. Nobody ain't going to go to prison or live in. The tax man ain't going to come knocking on the door. But after that game, I was tapped up. But it was a half time. Like most of the guys, uh, Wimbledon was a great club. But there was some individuals that just wanted to do it on themselves. They thought they could cross it and be on the end of it and score, you know? And, well, I'm a miserable player anyway. You know what I mean? I was moaning, moaning. I said, just give me the effing ball. <laughs> right. But the first one I, I, I smacked in, I turned around to Mickey Belfield. I'll never forget him because this guy don't pass the ball. He was like Gary, you know what I mean? <laughs> didn't, like to, didn't like to give the ball, yeah? So I said, you see what the bloody hell happens when you give me the effing ball, right? He gave me a pass the next one. Second one went in, you know? And we beat you 3-2 at the death. That's right. So listen, so you signed for Brentford, 1982 to 1987, scored 44 goals in 110 appearances. But like I said... Goals. So that, yeah, again, this is like, this is on... The, just, oh, the internet may have got it right or wrong, but 110, 44 no, goals, okay. there might be oh, a more. Of you know, there might be a few more. But also, but the thing that I noticed just going through it, not only did you score goals, you used to set up a hell of a lot of goals as well. So... You were over in the middle, you were down the wing, there's bang, bang into Gary Roberts, Gary Roberts scores a goal, Gary Roberts, boom, down the wing, scores down, over to you, bang. So between yourselves, and then all the rest of them, Chris Kamara's in there, bang, Gary Roberts, Gary Roberts, Chris Kamara, Chris Kamara, Francis Joseph, bang in the back of the net. It was, like, the combination was absolutely lethal, wasn't it? It was great. Look, I don't know what Dave done with his book, right, but, you know, like, reading his book, the first, like, from the 80s and all that, bloody hell, I could get an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it was, it was the feet, you know, like all the names that you mentioned, it was just all us, all us, all us. It was a really fantastic time. And, then, and I'm going to mention some of the names as well. I mean, that, that team, the 1982 83 season, Fred Callahan was manager. Um, like I said to you, you signed 40 grand that you signed for as well for Brentford. Obviously, it was, uh, there was a little bit of underhand activity that went in beforehand as well. You know? I, only got, I only got a fiver. <laughs> that's right. That's I right. Didn't, I didn't get. I, I weren't gasping. Yeah, that's right. And, but you got signed at the same time as Tony Mahoney as well, who yeah. was an absolutely tremendous player as well. And uh, if things didn't happen, you know, he broke his leg at the time. And if, if that hadn't happened at the time, Brentford could have been on another level. But, you know, these things happened, didn't they? Well, put it this way. When I, when I came to Brentford, I saw from the previous seasons that very good side. The side didn't really change. Their, their problem was scoring goals. You know, Gary Johnson... Uh, Bowen, I forget his first name. What was it? Keith? Keith, Keith yeah. Bowen. Gooseneck. <laughs> right, those two were their centre forwards, and Tony Mahoney and myself replaced them. Uh, the fullbacks, and that was it, really. To be fair, everything else was stayed in place. You had your Chris Kamara, you had your Terry Hurlock, centre midfield, Gary Roberts, left or right on the wide. Uh, who was the other one? I can't remember. Well, I'll go for the names. You've got Stan no, Bowles. You had later. Jim McNichol. Oh, yeah, you had Stan Bowles. Alan Whitehead. Yeah, you had was, Peter was, Barota, Bob yeah. Booker, Keith Bowen, Gary Johnson, Gary yeah. Roberts, Terry Hurlock, Tony Mahoney, Terry Rowe, Barry Tucker, Gary Wilkins, Walker Spencer. That's that was, right. that, those are the boys in the team that year. Yeah. 
you know, when Gary said about defensively, uh, uh, you know, like where we fell down, we, we was an attacking team. Where we fell down, it was mistakes. Collectively, we were okay, in my opinion, but it was individual mistakes that cost us. There were some games that we get, you know, we've battered teams, but we didn't score. You know, the goalkeeper might have a great time at Griffin Park and all that sort of stuff, or away from home. But, you know, that's the football, you know what I mean? And it sums it up as well, because that season, that same 82 season, Brentford scored 88 goals that season. Portsmouth won the league and they scored 74. So it just goes to show you kind of what the firepower was in that league of the Brentford I team. I was there the following season. 82. That's the same season. That the 82. Season? Yeah, the same season. The Joe's been missing for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't take my medication that <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. That's fair enough. Gary had that's right. Manor. That's right, yeah. Okay. So, but this is, again, this was the season because, again, I'm not just correct you if you're wrong. This is the season. We had a Milk Cup run, which you talked about as well, yeah. uh, where we played Swansea. Yeah. As well, um, beat Wimbledon in the early rounds as well, and Blackburn oh, as well over sure. two legs. Yeah, that t- tell us about those games because those must have been really exciting for you. Well, put it this way, I couldn't believe it. I signed for Brentford. The fixtures came out, the Milk Cup fixtures came up, and I'm playing Wimbledon. I thought, oh my god, you know, I'm going to get some serious abuse. You know what I mean? But having said that, that I got presented with my Player of the Year trophy. You know, and then Dave Besson decided to sit on me when I was getting up to go and get the first goal and Tony Mahoney scored it instead and he goes we said before the game whatever we do we know we're going to lose but as long as Joe don't score right and that was his uh, that's that was his tactic you know but the second game at Griffin Park we just we turned them over I know it was only 2-0 but we was it was, it was comfortable from from the first whistle. Yeah. That's right. You know I mean? and, and then we talked about the Swansea game, Gary Roberts, we, the Swansea, yeah. and, they, and we did the, draw it at home, but then we took them in the replay as well. And that was a big game because Swansea in them days, they were a big side. They were like Division One. It was just like they were up there. It was yeah. John Toshek was, Toshek yeah. was the man, wasn't he? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that was a big game. As Dave said earlier on, he goes, there was, what, the capacity was, uh, the, well, the crowd was, what, 15, 17,000. Come on, that place was full to the rafters. It was fantastic. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, getting the draw was great. We had we weren't daunted at all because we saw from that first game that hey, we can do it. You know. So we went over to the Vetchville and well, he half done it. You know what I mean? <laughs> with, with help from others. That's you know? right. That's right. And, and and then the next game was the big one, and I remember this one as well. And like I said to you, a lot of maybe some people there as well. Nottingham Forest in the next game. And at that time, Forest, it's funny because we play Forest now. I mean, Forest might go down next week. Um, yeah. um, but they tell us about their sort of European kind of, uh, you know, their, their European background and everything like that. And this was the time when Forest had won the, Euro- the European yeah. Cup, didn't it? They'd yeah. won the European Cup. They had Cluffy in there and they were doing the business. And all of a sudden, it's like, we're playing Forest. So this was like the big, this is like bigger than Liverpool and everything like that at the time. It was a massive game. We did a, a train. There was a special train going from uh, Ealing Broadway up to Nottingham. I remember that. I got off what I was doing at school or whatever like that at the time and I bunked off. Even our owner, Matthew Benham as well, he bunked off school. He went to Slough Grammar and he actually bunked off school to go up to Nottingham Forest for that game as well. It was like a big... Everyone <laughs> had to be there. It was just absolutely wicked. I wasn't allowed to go. You weren't allowed to go? Oh, loyal. You school, you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, levels, yeah. So, but you went up there as well. But it's funny, we got on this train, and I think the train must have left about 11 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a 7.30 kickoff, at 11, 12 o'clock, and we got there at half time because <laughs> <laughs> the train was just crawling along, like, you know. So we actually missed the first goal, which I think, I can't remember who scored it, and then we missed it, you know, but Brentford on two. But, but still, that was a great little, you know, for you to be there at, at, for the forest ground for that game. Yeah, it, it, it was good, but... We didn't perform that day at all. That night, should I say. Uh, What's his name? Colin Todd played centre-half. I've got to admit, for the first time in my life, hands up, I was in his pocket. I I didn't get a kick. It was outstanding. Nottingham Forest was outstanding that night. You know? You would have expected that as well, though, didn't you? Yeah, we we, we did expect it. But maybe that was half of the battle. You know what I mean? We expected it, and we got what we deserved. Even though it wasn't embarrassing... It was 2 0, I believe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, 2 0. 2 0. And we didn't, we, we, you know, we didn't get, a, I don't think we had a shot on target. 
the goalkeeper never put this way. Whatever shot he had, he could have taken off his gloves, thrown it at the ball, and saved it. You know what I mean? One of those scenarios. You know what I mean? Yeah, we was poor. Yeah, we was very really poor. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that was it. And look, but that season we're still on fire because you and, Joe and Tony Mahoney scored twenty nine goals between you, which was absolutely wicked. But he broke his leg, Mahoney, in the Swindon Cup replay. And again, you look at that, you think this guy's a cup replay. If he'd lost the game, then maybe it wouldn't have happened. But in the in the cup replay, he did. So we signed. Remember old Keith Cassells from uh, South. For yeah. 25k, yeah. you know, um, but that was it. Our season just petered out after that. You yeah. know, it, was, it was all over, wasn't it? But, but it was a, a defensive frailties, in my opinion. You know, what I mean, attacking wise, we was always offensive. We had stand bowls, stand bowls. Look, put it this way, I, I can. Si I'm sitting here right now, and I will tell you, stand bowls is the best football player I ever played with in my life. Okay, one movement. <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, I, I've got to say, Gary was third. Yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> can, I, can I say this? I've actually moved up the ranking order right? since I last spoke to him. No, no, but as a, as a striker, right, all you had to do, stands on the football, all you had to do was sh move your shoulder and he knows what direction you're going in and the ball's getting delivered. Like, and I believe... Yeah. Uh, I believe. <laughs> I believe. I believe. I believe that, uh, you know, my first season at Brentford, 26 goals, yeah, all told, yeah. It should have been 60, yeah. <laughs> on, on, no, you'd make a move and all of a sudden the balls, he would be knocking the ball and the balls at your feet and you're thinking, shit, and you're falling over the ball. You can't believe it. The guy was unbelievable. Stan Bowles was one of the best... English players on this planet, yeah? In 40 years, I don't think, people talk about Gascoigne, the nearest to him, I'd say, was Glenn Hoddle, okay? Right, because none of them tackled. You know, like, if there was a 50-50, Stan would say, go on, you can have it. <laughs> you know, Glenn Hoddle was the same, you know? But Stan Bowles, marvellous. Wasn't selfish, and his routine, <laughs> right? <laughs> his routine for a match day, like, we'd have a meeting at, uh, what, quarter past two? Stan would be in the betting shop, right? He'd come to the meeting, quarter past two. Meeting's finished. Yeah, 15, 20 minutes. He'd be going back to the betting shop. He'd come back to the ground to get changed at quarter to three. He'd put his kit on. What, you see all these players nowadays stretching, doing all this nonsense and all that. Stan needs to shake both legs and he's good to go. <laughs> I swear on my children's life, that is what Stan was like. And he'll say, look, listen, uh, Joe, uh, hold it up a little bit, make your runs, da 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 da. And that was it. And that was his warm up, mate. Trust me. Stan Bowles. Super boots. Super boots. What do you want, Billy? So, so uh, yeah. So we're just just going back to the, yeah, just going back to when you when you supported um when you uh when you signed for like I said when you signed for Brentford and there was a little chant that used to go. Do you remember a little chant? Yeah, but they nicked it off the. Yeah, but the Wimbledon supporters used to do that. Uh, see, Jojo, I, yeah, have a go. go yeah, Jojo. Well, I was the one that brought that chart to Brentford, so I teethed it off the Wimbledon fans. Oh, you nicked it? It did was you? me, mate. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Did you pay for it? Yes, I did. Were you arrested? Yes. You were? Yeah, I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll, and, uh, talk, we'll talk later. We'll talk later, you know what I'm saying? So I remember my, my hey, Wimbledon. bring your brother to this No, 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 my brother. He, <laughs> but yeah, my, the, my Wimbledon friends told me it was a Jojo, have a go thing, yeah. so I brought that to Brentford, but it was easy chant, you know, Joe, Joe, have a go, brilliant. So, hey, Joe, Joe, have a go, Joe, Joe, have a go, Joe, Joe, have a go. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely love that. It was absolutely fantastic. And um, you guys won't believe this. There was one game, we was one nil down, right? And there was a, a, a woman behind a goal. It was the, what was the other end? Not the Ealing Road end. The Brook Road. Brook Road. Oh, no, the Royal, the, new, the, new, the, the, the Royal Oak. The Royal Oak. <laughs> right. And she's gone, we're one nil down. We're desperate. We can't get this equaliser. And she's gone, Joe, have a go. <laughs> <laughs> he, he took the corner, because he was on corners. He took the corner, flipping hell, and it just dropped on my head, didn't it? It was 1-1. One, one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Or, I couldn't believe it. Joe, have a good It's like she was going, it's like she was on her knees going, Joe! <laughs> it was brilliant. Honestly, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And also, like I said, I used to see you. Your old man used to come down. My dad, yeah. every game. Every game, your dad every was there. Game, yeah. Your brothers used to come down, everyone like yeah. that. And I used, yeah. to, I used to pester you a bit, actually, didn't I? We, did you? I was pester you. <laughs> <laughs> someone pester. that looked like you. It was yeah. someone that looked like you. That's right. I wouldn't was, say it was you. I wouldn't, but that, I wouldn't yeah. say it was my brother. I wouldn't pester, but I was, I was quite excited that you were at the club, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To be, again, to be fair as well, because, again, at, in the 80s, the first black footballer for Brentford, Chris Kamara, Again, and I think sure. that pretty much that you were the second black footballer as well. No, no, you had apprentices, uh, you had Terry Rowe. Ter I was going to say Terry Rowe. Was that it? That was yeah, it, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, really? that was it. Kipper. I Kipper Lee. Who's Kipper? Oh, nah, that, 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 that was later, that was later. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> oops, oops. It was alleged. It's allegedly, actually, we'll move on from that one anyway. But yeah, but again, from, but for me, um, goal scorer, top player. You know, you relate to your, your kid and just sort of seeing somebody up there on a pedestal. I was actually very proud to sort of seeing you play. And, you know, you and Chris were, you know, you were top, top players for me as a young black kid living in Isleworth, coming to Brentford. You know, because, you know, that's just... Isleworth? I lived in Isleworth, well, mate, black, you know what I'm saying? Black people live in Isleworth? No, it's, it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> it was just me, Joe. <laughs> and that's why I was very happy when you came down to them lads, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to be fair, you know, you know, I made my debut for Wimbledon, obviously, as you know, as a professional. Yeah, and I, oh god, I, oh, I thought flipping. Hell. When I made my debut, I went, I went out for the warm up. I went, but black people don't play football, <laughs> you know. And I went out for my warm up, and you know, I came back in for the pre warm up, and there was a couple of white kids rushing out, got all graph and all that. I went. What the fuck's going on here, man? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was probably like Anthony and Joshua last night. You know what I mean? my, my chest bigged out a little bit. You know what I mean? I went, hey, they're all right. You know what I mean? So I went out there, you know, and I did okay. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's, that's what, what it's all about. It's, it's about confidence and, and people accepting, you know? It, you know, like one of the things, like, look, look at uh, Chris Hutton. Chris Hutton, absolutely marvellous boy. His brother, if you, any of you guys remember, played for Brentford. Yeah? No, Chris played. I, I, you know, as well, his brother, his younger brother played. Yeah, Henry. Henry, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay? Yeah. Right? But look at what he's done. But the brothers ain't getting no job. It's only, they're giving it to the people like him, man. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? What about the brothers, man? Vote for Donald. <laughs> hey? <laughs> Donald Duck, yeah? <laughs> But, hey, yeah, but, about that. We but, that's, but, that, but that's life. Look, listen, I know Gary. Look, the difference, is, uh, what a lot of people don't know, like, this guy here, right? Yeah, we're the same age. He might be a year older. Yeah, you could tell by the grace. Yeah, <laughs> right? You know, and uh, various other things. But anyway, right, I was 15 years old. We played for, I played for an under-18 team. It was called Chalk Hill Football Club. And that is, if you remember, if anybody knows... Chalk Hill, that's Wembley. Right near Wembley Stadium. You could walk to Wembley Stadium in five minutes. Yeah, Chalk Hill Football Club. We played there. All black guys. All black guys. You know, we were all hanging and shit. You know, whatever you want to call it. You know? Yeah? And we get this little white boy, right? Comes in, right? With a friend of his, you know? He played left wing and uh, Barry, was it? was it Barry? Jim, Jim, Maloney, a little, Jim, little fat Irish boy. Played fullback, <laughs> right? Two little white boys, you know, with these two, with these strapping brothers, you know what I mean? <laughs> we kicked ass all season, yeah? Was it two or one season? It was two seasons, wasn't it? I think it was two seasons. Yeah, one you know everything. what I mean? One everything. Yeah, and the brothers, you know, burning their spliff and shit like that at <laughs> half time. <laughs> that, that, that was the team... <laughs> That was a team talk, you know? <laughs> Just burn! <laughs> anyway, we really done well. We kicked ass. We, we was always in the top three. Top two, always looking for promotion, whatever. Anyway, he's turned professional, you know, years later. And I've turned professional. All of a sudden, I had a, I had a choice. 
I could have went to Millwall or Brentford from Wimbledon. There was no way I was going to Millwall. <laughs> what was that? Why is that then? Hey, they offered me more money, yeah. but Can't believe it. they're dockers, mate. I, I worked at uh, South Quay, and it's just the, the spirit in that area is not good. You know what I mean? So I, well, this is what I know now, right? But at that time, I thought, fuck yeah, now, sorry for the language. I thought, the stick, the stick that I used to get <laughs> right at Millwall, there's nowhere I was going to sign for them. I could have a nightmare game, miss free sitters, bang, I'd be flipping hanging from a lamppost the next day. <laughs> You think I'm joking, but that's what they used to say. Look, we, we, played, we, played Millwall. we played Millwall on a Sunday. Our first Sunday game, right? Uh, uh, and uh, Gary, uh, Paul Roberts. There's Millwall fans in the house, yeah? Uh, no, Claire, Claire's having a domestic. What's going on? Okay. Are we finished? Yeah. Uh, we beat him 2-1. Paul Roberts played fullback or centre-half for us. He was voted player of the year the previous season, right? When I got the second goal, I don't know who told... Well, I got both goals, should I say, that day, remember, right? Who told... I've gone to... I was getting so much stick, I've gone to the Millwall fans like that. And they've gone absolutely mad and they've rushed down to them. They were shaking the fence. You black this, you black that. Gary Robert, uh, Paul Roberts has gone and waved to the main stand and all that. Some guy came on and chinned him. And chinned him. Right? Okay? Right? He was player of the year, the previous year. So, you know, what? I'm going to sign for it. I made a right choice, didn't I? Don't you think? Yeah. Thank you. So, just list one last thing as we're going to go up to, you know, we're going to go. We're going to actually going to, it's been very entertaining. We might come back to these guys afterwards because we've got the comedian, which is Tim, coming on in two seconds. But we've just got a little message for, uh, for Francis and Gary, actually, from a, a, a friend of ours or a, a mutual friend of ours, a besotted friend of ours as well. So, as we, we always come out with a little surprises here and there. So, here we go. A little message for you boys. Hi, Billy. Um, you've asked me to do a tribute to a couple of my teammates, um, Joel and Garspin, Gary Roberts. Two fabulous players that I played with. We had a great team in those days. If we hadn't lost Tony Mahoney when we did with that serious injury, we know we would have got promoted, but he got a bad, bad, bad injury. And we never really recovered from that. Um, but it was an, really enjoyable to play with you two, and of course to play with Bowlesy and Herlock. And Beast fans remember that midfield uh, very, very fondly, which is, which is great. Absolutely great. Any stories? Well, the only story I can really remember obviously um, was the one where myself and Joe got injured against Wigan. I went off against Wigan to have six stitches in my knee and Dr. Radley Smith was sewing me up. The next minute Joe got carried in with a suspected broken leg and um, Radley Smith stitched up my knee, put six stitches in and then told me to get up and go back onto the pitch. As I got up to go back on the pitch I felt a sharp pain, massive sharp pain in my knee and he'd left the needle that he'd put the stitches in my, in my knee. So as I'm screaming, he's um, decided to cut the little bit of um, stitch, tie it up properly, and I was able to go back on the pitch. So after the game, he went, um, well, the only person I would have in the trenches out of those two, Francis Joseph and Chris Kamara, would be um, Chris Kamara. So the report came back from the hospital after they carted Joe up to the hospital that he'd, he'd actually got a broken leg. So Joe, Bradley Smith didn't think you were a top man, but I certainly do, and both of you too. And with those Brentford fans tonight, have a fabulous time. So listen, Thanks very much. We've got Tim Clark coming on here, Brentford comedian as well. But listen, we might have a little, couple of little, finish it off with these guys here because it's been a good little conversation as well. But you're going to be here all night as well, so we'll bring you back into the conversation at the time and we'll just have some glass. But listen, just for now, Gary Roberts, Francis Joseph.
to check out part two and part three of the besotted Pride of West London end of season podcast featuring Graham Benstead and Billy Manuel, go to besotted.co.uk or Audio Boom channel Besotted. And don't forget to subscribe. Come on, come on, you